Hello, my name is Matt Sandbank and I am a professional shadow puppeteer. Now what I always tell my audiences is that shadow puppetry is a very forgiving art form and that is one of my favorite things about it. What that means is you don't have to be a really talented visual artist to make a great shadow puppet. Also, shadow puppetry is made out of very inexpensive, easy to find materials. So you don't have to be afraid of making a mistake. If you make a mistake, you can just remake it using some of those easy to find materials and you can try things over and over again until you get it just right. And that's what I still do today. Even though I've been doing it 10 years, I still make mistakes. I still do a lot of trial and error for every new puppet skit I make. So today we're gonna go step by step through the process of making our own shadow puppets. First, I'll teach you how to design a puppet, and you can either design your own or use some of the shadow puppet templates that I've provided. We will also turn those drawings into jointed figures, then we'll add control rods to the puppets, and finally, I'll teach you how to manipulate the puppets on a shadow screen, and I'll even show you how to make a simple shadow screen in your own den or living room or bedroom. Now, in between these skits, you'll also get to see one of my finished Shadow Puppet skits, a real crowd pleaser, and you'll get to see how a finished Shadow Puppet uh, skit might look in front of a live audience. The first step to making a Shadow Puppet is design, which is a fancy way of saying drawing. You're going to draw your Shadow Puppet first. For this step, you're going to need either a piece of cardstock if you have it. If you don't, maybe you have an empty cereal box around the house. For drawing, start with a pencil just because you can erase mistakes that you make, but if you have it, it's nice to finish up with a sharpie marker, some kind of thick marker, so that when you're cutting, you have a very clear line to follow. Uh, I've gone ahead and drawn these things ahead of time. Uh, and when you're drawing or designing your shadow puppet, there are two main ideas you want to follow. The first is make your drawing big. Try to take up the entire page that you're working with because a larger shadow puppet has a better chance of being seen by the audience. The second idea is profile. For shadow puppets, the puppets work a lot better if you're seeing the outside silhouette or the side of the puppet more than if you're looking at the puppet head on. What that means in a drawing is you don't want to do a lot of internal details. You want to do mostly uh, the, the profile, the outside shape. In the case of my face, there'd be my hair, my nose, my chin, maybe a little bit of the glasses, but you wouldn't want to get a lot of those internal details. Let me show you what I mean. This is a shark that I drew. It takes up the whole page. It does not have very many internal details. It's got this eye, and then it's got a few jagged teeth, but for the most part, it's just the body, the shape of the shark. Next, I have a dodo bird. Same idea, takes up the whole page. The only detail is the eye. I didn't draw any of the feathers. I didn't draw any scaly legs, because those won't really show up as a shadow puppet, and they don't add to the experience for the audience. I also drew a person. This is an old man with a cane. You're going to know what I'm going to say already. Takes up the whole page. Not many internal details, just that eyeball. And you wouldn't even really need to put in that eyeball if you didn't want to. So those are the puppets you'll see me make step by step today. And there's also these templates at the end of the lesson if you want to make these puppets yourself. You can also design your own, and I encourage you to do that. Before you get set designing your own puppet, let me show you uh, some mistakes that I commonly see students make. I do these workshops all over the country at all sorts of different schools and libraries, and I've seen lots of students in lots of different places make similar mistakes. And the first one is details. I say draw a puppet, and they make a drawing like this, which is a very interesting drawing, but it doesn't translate very well to shadow puppetry because these eyes and this nose and this mouth would all be difficult to cut out for the first place. And in second place, even if you did cut it out, it wouldn't add to the shadow puppet very much. A lot of times in shadow puppetry, less is more. The fewer details you have in the puppet, sometimes the more the audience imagines for themselves. And it actually brings the puppet to life even better if you have less. So this would be too detailed, and it's that front view what might work better is something like this, which is from the side, uh, and you have the, the side of the face, the nose, the mouth, 
the eye. Look at the difference in the way that I drew the eyes, the nose, and the mouth in this profile than in this face-on drawing. So try to do something more like a profile in your designing. The second mistake I see a lot of times is uh, people make drawings that don't cut out well into puppets. This drawing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, except that it is too small. It would be very hard to cut out, and even when you did cut it out, it would be uh, difficult to fit your rods or anything else that you would need uh, to bring this shadow puppet to life. So this artist would need to make this puppet larger. You also don't want to do a stick figure because you run into the same problem of not having any place to put your rods and also the puppet doesn't hold together very well if it's too thin. So you want something that is both big and has a little bit of thickness to it so that you can add all of your rods and everything else you need to the puppet. So try to do those things, make your puppet big, make it a profile picture without very many internal details, and when you have designed your puppet, you can move on to the next step. So right now you have designed your shadow puppet, but what you have is a, simply a drawing. And to make a shadow puppet a shadow puppet, what you have to do is articulate the movement, which is just a, a way of saying, give it lots of different moving parts. And to hold those moving parts together, you need joints. So you have to make a jointed figure. Let me show you one of my shadow puppets to show you the different ways that that can work. Uh, this is a Tyrannosaurus Rex that I use in one of my shows. And the three ways that I usually use to joint the different pieces of the puppet are uh, a paper fastener. That's a brass paper fastener. Uh, you probably have seen these before. They look, they look like this. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, and those are used usually when you want to have really controlled movement and when you have two big pieces of plastic that need to be held together really well. So the head of the Tyrannosaur and the neck fit that description. When you need movement to be really free and easy, when you want the pieces of the puppet to be held together really loosely, what, I, what you do is you take a really tiny hole, you make a really tiny hole in the plastic, and then I take a piece of fishing line, and I thread it through both of those holes, and I tie it into a knot. You can see a knot is right there, and it's tied into a knot on the other side as well. And that makes for a puppet that moves really, really loosely, um, almost on its own. And that is the leg of the puppet. And sometimes you want something that is somewhere in between those two, and for that you want to use... Um, use thin floral wire. This is just a thin metal wire that I wrap into a spiral and his back leg is used with that because that one uh, needs just a little more control to it in the skit. So those are the three ways that I use to make uh, joints for the shadow puppet. Um, and today you're going to be using brass paper fasteners. Those are the easiest to work with at home and they have the most uses. Uh, so start with these, and then as you make more and more shadow puppets, you might experiment with the other forms. And just for fun, let me show you how this Tyrannosaur looks and moves when we've got all those jointed pieces working together. A little something like this. So, to add joints onto your uh, puppet, you're going to need two brass paper fasteners. Those are the best things to use to start with when you're making shadow puppets. This is kind of the standard uh, material used to join two pieces of a puppet together. And you're going to need another piece of cardstock or cereal box, if that's what you're using. Uh, and the first thing you do is you simply cut around the outside of the shape. I've already done that with this shark here. 
And harder than figuring out what kind of material to use to join the two pieces of the puppet is actually figuring out where to join the puppet together. You can see I've made a dashed line here and a dashed line here. We always want to start off by making puppets that have three pieces. Uh, three pieces for a shadow puppet is the standard. There are plenty of puppets that have more, but the easiest way to learn the principles of shadow puppet making is to begin with three pieces. So I've drawn this dash line and this one because I am imagining how this shark might move, where it might move its tail and its head. Uh, to decide where you put the dash lines, you basically decide which part of the puppet character you want to see moving. And so that's what I've done. And I should say here that you shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. This is just a piece of cardstock or a cereal box. Shadow puppetry is, is not a super expensive uh, kind of puppetry to dabble in. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. If you make a mistake and cut in the wrong place and it doesn't work out for you, then you can remake it pretty easily by retracing again. You don't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. So here, we've got these dash lines already drawn. I'm going to cut these out. And now once I have my three pieces, I'm going to trace them again on this sheet of paper, this cardstock or the cereal box, whatever the case may be. Do this real quick. I'm going to stop drawing where the dotted line begins. I'll explain why in just a minute. Redraw these teeth. And I stop again where the dashed lines go. So I'll add that eye back on. And instead of connecting these two pieces where the dashed line used to go, what I'm going to do instead is add an overlap. Better to go big. Uh, if, if you end up making too big of an overlap, you can always cut away more, but if you make it too small, uh, you can't add on uh, pieces of the puppet so easily. So go, go big for that part. Uh, and the reason why you're adding an overlap is because when you rejoin the pieces of the puppet together, you don't want it to have this uh, strange separation there. If you have the overlaps, uh, the movement will seem continuous, and you'll see what that, uh, what I mean by that later on. So, tracing, stop at the dotted line, stop at the dotted line, remove, and then add an overlap, and an overlap. And we have one more piece here. And they don't have to all line up. When you cut them out and join them, the puppet will uh, will line up just fine. Trace, stop at the dotted line, stop at the dotted line, remove, and add an overlap. Now, once we have three pieces, we can cut that out. And here we have are three pieces of the puppet. We are ready to join them together. What we do is we hold them together just to make sure the puppet looks more or less how we imagined it looking. That's going to have a good fish-like flipping of the tail. Um, you take your two pieces of the puppet, hold them together, and you draw a dot right where, right kind of in the middle of this overlap. You want to get as close to the center as possible. I'm going to keep my pen right there, remove that, and then add the other one. Let's do that again right here. I'm going to have them overlap. I'm going to draw right in the center of the overlap. Then I'm going to lift my pen up, remove... Oh look, it bled through. That's great. Takes the guesswork out of it. So, we've got those three pieces, and then we just take our friend the hole punchers and punch everywhere we see a dot. It's okay if you don't end up exactly, precisely, 100% on the dot. It will probably work out just fine, and if it doesn't, there's any number of adjustments you can make. Cutting little pieces of the puppet away. Uh, that one actually made it a pretty far way away from there. If it doesn't look good later, we can cut this and then add uh, 
add another dot there. If you don't like where you end up putting a dot, just put a piece of duct tape or some kind of opaque tape over it to, to block that out. That way light won't shine through it. Uh, and then you can make all kinds of mistakes and move on. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and punch out that eyeball right now since I already have my uh, hole punch. We've got our three pieces of the puppet and now we just take our paper fastener and drop it through. What you want to do is you want to uh, you want to drop the paper fastener through so that the rounded end is facing you. This is the rounded end right here and I call this the pointy end because it's pointed. Um, you, you want the rounded end to face you because the way you're looking at the puppet is how the audience is going to be looking at the puppet and so you want the rounded end to be against the screen that way it won't snag the puppet screen. Uh, so you try that puppet out in your hands if it looks like it moves well uh, you're good to go. I feel like this shark ended up looking a little longer than I originally intended it to, so I'm going to make an adjustment here. This is not necessary, it's just depending on how you think the puppet is moving, but I want to show you that it's okay to make adjustments and mistakes and it won't lead to disaster with your puppet. Reattach that, and now we have a shark. Jointed and ready for the next step, but before we move on, let me show you how I made the joints for the dodo bird and the old man with the cake. Dodo bird, I decided to give a flapping wing as well as a leg that could hop. So you can see I cut and then added an overlap, cut and added an overlap. With the old man, I made it so his arm could move with the cane and that his second leg could move. I just cut these pieces off and added an overlap. Now remember that whatever puppy you make, start by trying it with three pieces. Three pieces is the standard for a shadow puppet, but even though most shadow puppets have three pieces, there's all kinds of different ways you can decide to joint the different pieces together. And play with some of these ideas, don't be afraid to make some mistakes, and when you have three pieces jointed together that you feel like move pretty well, you're ready to add some rods to your puppet, which is what we will do next. So now you have a jointed figure and you're about ready to add rods to it. We're going to use flexi straws for your puppet today because those are easy things to find around the house. But first, let me show you the rods that I use for my puppets. They all start with a coat hanger. I take a metal coat hanger out of my closet and I bend it into shape with a pair of pliers until I have a kind of a hook, if you will, and then I glue it into a piece of wooden dowel rod and that creates a really sturdy, durable rod that I can perform with all over the place. Uh, but a lot of times those materials are hard to work with, so we'll be using something different for your puppet. Let me show you some of my puppets once I've added the rods to them. This is an astronaut, and he can go in zero gravity or very low gravity, 
to go bouncing across the surface of a planet. And you'll notice that with this puppet, I have four rods. I am using something called controlled movement with this puppet. It means every single part of the puppet that moves is controlled by one of these rods. There's no part, no arm, no leg that is not controlled somehow by the rods. So sometimes you'll have controlled movement, and other times you'll have what's called incidental movement. That's when you don't have complete control with a rod over what your puppet does. Here's an example. This puppet is used to press buttons. This is a button pushing puppet. So I've got one rod attached to that arm, and I've got one rod attached to the head so he can look in various directions. Those are controlled movement. But there's a whole bottom half of the puppet, these legs, which swing freely. And that is incidental movement. Now during the puppet skit, he'll be at the bottom of the screen, so his legs are on the platform. It gives them a little bit more, uh, they don't, you know, fly back and forth too wildly, but they still go more or less where they want. I don't have complete control over what his legs do during the show, so that is incidental movement. And we'll be using both controlled and incidental movement with your puppets. Let's take a look at these. Now let's add some rods onto that puppet of yours. We're going to use flexi straws because these are easy to find around the house, and we're going to just use two. You saw on some of my puppets three or even four rods, and that's fine once you've gotten familiar with making shadow puppets, but when you're starting, one, two, three puppet pieces and one, two rods is what you want to go for. So we're just going to tape these onto the back of the puppet using some regular old scotch tape. And we want the rod to stick straight up in the air with the puppet flat on the table. We just lay that tape down. You can use multiple pieces of tape if you like, but one should do the trick if you get it in the right spot. Now, we have these rods and we can hold the puppet and control it by keeping our hands a good deal away from the puppet. If you want to make these more sturdy, there's a couple of ways to do that. If you have a thin dowel rod, you can slide that into the straw as though the straw is a sleeve, and then you take a piece of tape and wrap it around, and then you have a much longer and much sturdier rod. But if you don't have one of these thin dowel rods around the house, you can do more or less the same thing with a pencil. You can stick the pointy end of the pencil into the opening of the rod. It won't slide in entirely like a sleeve, but you can get at least some extra length on your rod that way, and a little more sturdiness. Not a ton, but a little more. And So now you, you have a puppet that can be operated from a good deal uh, away, so that your hands won't show up on the screen. Now, um, let me take these off for just a second. to talk to you about something called mechanical advantage. There's lots of different places that you can put your rods on the puppet. And just like when you were figuring out where to put the joints for your puppet, this is a uh, trial and error kind of moment. You can try lots of different arrangements, and if it's a problem, you just take the rod back off. Nothing lost. So try out lots of things until you find out what works. But one principle you want to follow is mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage means getting a lot for a little. And the way you get mechanical advantage is you look where the bend of your straw is. You want the bend of your straw to be close to the nearest joint. Bend right here, joint right here. Bend right here, joint right here. When you have good mechanical advantage, it means you can make that puppet move a lot by moving your hands very, very little. You can see I'm barely even moving my fingers here, and it makes that tail swish back and forth. Same here. Barely even moving my hand, and that, uh, and that shark's head can go, you know, far back. So I can make this fish swim with very, very little effort. If you do the opposite, though, if you, you can see that these rods are identically placed, but the L is in, in the opposite spot. Right here, the L is all the way over here, and the joint is here. Here, the L is all the way over here, and the joint is there. You can see that the puppet with mechanical advantage is much much closer. And that one moves with just a tiny bit of a twist of the fingers. But without mechanical advantage, it, it just doesn't move uh, quite as well. To get that same 
uh, movement, I've got to move my hand all the way up and down, which you can do, but it's just is more work and it makes the puppet less responsive to what you're trying to do and it leads to a lot fewer possible movements. So always try to get mechanical advantage on your side by putting the L next to the joint. Uh, we were talking earlier about controlled movement versus incidental movement. This old man has controlled movement because I'm controlling his leg and his, his cane arm right here. And it takes a little work, but you can get him to, to walk pretty well. That's a neat movement. But the dodo bird offers us some more choices. This first choice is one with some controlled movement. I'm controlling the leg here with this hand and the wing here with this hand. But what if we tried using some of that incidental movement that we talked about? What if we let the dodo bird's leg hang free? We can put a rod instead on the head and one on the wing. So we have controlled movement on the wing and on the head, but that leg is flying kind of free. It makes a different kind of movement. The character becomes a little different when it's hopping around that way. And you could even add a second leg here and have, so it had two legs hopping around. So that's how you add your straws and that and de de deciding what you do with the straws uh, is your own artistic choice whether you want to have controlled movement or incidental movement, but whether you do controlled or incidental movement, you always want to try to have mechanical advantage by having the L close as possible to the joint. So next we're going to move to the shadow screen and I'll show you how to actually manipulate these puppets on a screen so that your shadows can become actors in a play. fun part. You've jointed your figure, you've added rods, you are now ready to manipulate your puppet. You get to see what it can do on the shadow screen. We'll talk about making a shadow screen in just a minute. Uh, so the first thing you want to keep in mind is that you want to keep your puppet flush against the screen. That means press it flat into the screen. The reason why is you want your audience to get a nice crisp view of that shadow. This is me with the shark pressed right against the screen. This is the shark only pulled about one inch away from the screen. So you can see that the shadow gets pretty fuzzy and indistinct pretty quickly. So you want to always keep that puppet flat on the screen so that the audience can see what it's doing. You also want to keep your hands usually as far away on the rod as you can while you're still... You want to be able to control the puppet, but you don't want to hold the rods up close because then it ruins the illusion because your hands, the shadow of your hands, shows up. So instead you want to hold the puppet further away so that your hands disappear. And so those are some tips about manipulating the puppet. Uh, also, I find that in my shows I'm always reminding myself to slow down. There are times in the puppet show when you would want some frantic movement like this wing that's flapping. A wing would, would often flap, you know, bonk, would often flap really fast, but generally speaking, you want your puppet to move not super slow, but slow enough for your audience to really understand what you're trying to get it to do. 
usually some slower movements do that better than a lot of frantic movements. So like I said, there are times in your puppet play when some frantic, really fast movement does need to happen. And finally, you always want to try to surprise your audience with your puppets. Uh, and part of that is playing with the puppet yourself and discovering what it can do. We think we have just an old man there, but it turns out he is a gymnast. Ta-da! Just because you've made an old man with a cane doesn't mean that he has to be your stereotypical old man with a cane. See what your puppets can do and see what kind of delightful surprises you can make for your audience. Let me show you real quick how to make an easy shadow puppet stage in your own home. To make a shadow puppet stage, you really only need two things. One, a translucent sheet that is pulled tight, some kind of translucent material that lets the light pass through and that's pulled tight so that the puppets can press against it. And the second thing you need is a light source, like a desk lamp or a flashlight, whatever you might have around the house. Now, it doesn't get much simpler than this, what I've done here. I've taken two kitchen chairs, and I've just taken a gray bed sheet. It doesn't even have to be a white bed sheet. Anything that lets the light pass through works just fine. So I've pulled the bed sheet taut across the tops of the chairs, and I've also tucked it in to the foot of the chair as well to give it a nice tightness there, a nice tight screen, and then you can see here that the shadow show up just fine. I can press just a little bit against that screen. I'll bring back a puppet that you've already seen before. Here's the astronaut from earlier. So as you can see, you can turn your bedroom or your living room, really any room, into your own shadow puppet theater to delight your friends and family. I hope you have fun doing that.